Thank you. Thank you for being with us. If you have a Bible, open to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16. And while you're doing that, if we could have Chloe come up here, and then Haley, and then uh, any other elementary kids. I don't see any other elementary kids. Oh, well, here we go. We got two more over here. And there we go. All right. You ready to take this? Chloe, you can take it this morning. Okay. Got it? You got it. Okay. What? Okay, go ahead. You can go ahead. Go ahead. We're working on it. We'll get there. Yes, yes. Go ahead and follow the cross on upstairs for the, for the craft. Wait a second, okay? okay. So I heard this. Uh, this is completely off topic, but you might like it. You know, because this, the kids are using screens so much, they said there's something going on where they like really tiny mini figurines. Have you seen that? That's what was going on. She had two handfuls of minifigs that she had to hand to somebody else. I don't know. When I was a kid, it was like the Tonka truck that you could throw off the road or something and hit with a hammer, and now it's all this little... Praise the Lord. We change, but he doesn't, right? Charlie, I'm going to use this as a... Okay, thanks. Mark chapter 16. I want to speak this morning about how the resurrection is more, far more, than a myth. In fact, the resurrection isn't a myth. And I want to talk about that today because somehow or another, in our understanding of the world and where we are, we've turned it into something that didn't factually or actually, historically, literally take place. We've made it a story. Now, for, let me just clarify what the word myth means. A lot of times we think of myth as something, if we say something is a myth, we say it's, you know, it doesn't, it, we, like this, well, it must not be true. The whole reason cultures have created myths was because there was a truth, something was true, and they wanted to create a story to reinforce how true it was. So let me, uh, or, or to give, give you an example. How many of you have ever heard of Charles Washington? He was George's brother and the guy that built this town, and if I understand correctly, some part of this building. Isn't that neat? How many of you know that George, his brother, infamously threw a silver dollar across the Potomac River. And that's probably a myth. I mean, even if we go down to the Potomac down here, you're not getting a coin across that thing. Right? Or maybe the cherry tree. Right? We got all the cherry blossoms in D.C., all from a myth. Okay. What, why did our, our, the, the founders of our country and those a couple generations after come up with that stuff? Was it because they wanted to, to say, he was a really lousy guy? No, it was the exact opposite. They wanted to, to, to say something about his strength and his superhuman power. So they come up with these things about throwing a coin across the river and his honesty. He's a stand-up guy. So when we use the word myth, we're not using it, most people when they use it, don't mean something derogatory. But here's what happens if the resurrection is just a myth. It means that Jesus isn't raised from the dead. See, the story of the resurrection is not just about how if you endure hardship, eventually your luck will turn and your ship will come in. I remember uh, at, a, at a, one of the midweek services in my first church, I had a lady there who was, she would come in every Wednesday night for Bible study, and she would say, Pastor, I'm just waiting for my ship to come in. I went to the, got the lotto tickets, wherever she did that week or that day right before she came in. And then she would let me know, I'm just waiting for my ship to come in, then I'm going to bless this church. One, one, one evening she was, she was in there and uh, was complaining about her hands. I said, oh, your hands are hurting. She said, yeah. I said, well, give them to me. So I just grabbed her hands and began to pray, and I got done, and she says, wow. Now, why did I bring her up? Because she had this myth and then a metaphor for the myth. When my ship comes in, because the, the belief was, you know, if I just endure it, eventually it'll, it'll change, and I'm going to win the lotto. See, see the, the problem here. So we use myth to create a story. If the resurrection is just a myth, we're still in our sins. So I want to point out that Jesus' resurrection was not just a myth. As a matter of fact, if we call it a myth, we do disservice to it. His resurrection, and I've got three M's for you if you're taking notes. His resurrection is a mystery. Aiden asked me questions. Why this? Why that? Why this? Why that? Why this? Why that? A lot of theology questions. 
It helps that he's at a Roman Catholic school, so he says, do we believe? Uh, no, we don't believe that. Do we? No, we don't. Yeah, we do believe that one, you know. Right? It's called, always got questions. And we like to explain things, don't we? As a matter of fact, being able to explain things helped us get people on the moon. It's helped us develop lots of medicines. We like to watch Little House on the Prairie. And, you know, like uh, every second episode, there's a plague and all the people are dying, you know. And, and Becky says, why do you watch this? It's so depressing. I said, because it's one of the only shows on TV where the dad's not a loser all the time. You know, <laughs> trying to teach my kids the truth here, you know, that dad, father knows best half the time, you know. So uh, I told him, I said, you know, back then, which wasn't that long ago, Advil could have done a whole lot of good. A little bit of fever-reducing medicine could have saved a lot of people. You with me? Yeah. Right? So we, I, I'm saying this because when I say the resurrection is mystery, somehow or another we switch in the mind and say, well, you know, I guess we just got to take it on blind faith. No. Mystery doesn't mean blind faith. Mystery means it's beyond our ability to explain. And God likes to do things beyond our ability. And he likes to make it where we trust him. Let me, let me throw this out there for those of you who like to, to prophesy. I'm wanting to pick on somebody for this one, but I don't think I will. I think I'll just stay here. The Lord doesn't give you a prophetic word. He doesn't give you a stirring in your spirit he, so that you know what to do. That's a byproduct. He gives you the information to let you know you don't know the whole picture and to trust Him to continue moving forward to create interdependence in the body. Show me someone who claims to be prophetic who shuts himself off from the church and I tell you that's not the Holy Spirit. So if God pours out the gifts of the Spirit in the church to create the church as a whole unity, as one people, as one community redeemed in Jesus Christ, why do we think that somehow or another when it comes to mystery He's going to tell us and explain to us the exact science of physically, what physically took place when Jesus rose from the dead. We watched the Shroud of Turin documentary here recently, right? And if you've seen that, they're all talking about, well, how did the image get there? And the guys that believe that it's real are talking about radiation emanating from the body. I don't, I don't even know if it's real. I mean, but does radiation emanating from your body do that? What is this, a Japanese cartoon? <laughs> it's mystery. The resurrection is mystery. So we need to worship the Lord with the awareness we can't understand everything. And just because we can't understand it doesn't make it not true. You with me? Secondly, uh, the resurrection is a marvel. That's why God does it as mystery. Because if the resurrection is a myth and it's a story that just reflects endurance so that you can do a better job or, or get success wherever it is that you have to get through, if that's all it is, there's no marvel anymore. When we hear the stories read from the Gospels about the resurrection, like the one this morning from Mark, did you notice what happens to the, to the women? They're, they're, they're marveling at what took place. They're full of fear and trepidation. I mean, it's one thing to hear Jesus say he's going to die and he's going to rise. And it's clear that when they go to the tomb, they're not going expecting to find him alive. They're going to prepare his body for a thorough burial, for a complete one. And the question they have is, how are we going to move that big rock? They're so eager to make sure he gets a burial, they haven't even put the, the, the plan together yet. They're not going because they understand it. They're going expecting to bury him the right way because everything was so rushed at the crucifixion. But then, what they don't anticipate grips their heart and they're given a time to marvel in wonder and in fear. When was the last time when we heard the gospel or we read the gospel and it woke up inside of us a sense of marvel that we were standing in awe of the Lord that he's done something that no one could do, that no one expected, that no one believed could be done, not even the people who were closest to him at the time. If the resurrection is not a mystery, it does not create marvel. If the resurrection is believed to be a myth created by first century Jews and then later on a couple Gentile thinkers who wanted to really go to the arenas and die for the pleasure of it, it's not a marvel. Mystery, marvel. Thirdly, it's majesty. 
It's the revelation of God's majesty. So how is it the revelation of His majesty? We've, we haven't seen it. Well, that's part of the mystery. You know, the long, like, um, who was it the other night, Friday night, in the Good Friday service? Someone was praying about uh, first love. I think it might have been Tim, praying about the Lord rekindling first love. Was it you? Okay, just to make sure I didn't, I didn't, yeah. You know how it is, and you're like, so-and-so was praying, and they're sitting over there like, no, it was not me, it was... <laughs> right, Liz? Okay, okay, thanks. Majesty. If there's no mystery, and you're not marveling, you don't see the majesty, and what happens to that first love? You know, when you first come into a living relationship with Jesus, there's this, this awe, there's this wonder, there's this revelation in your heart of God's majesty and His power, and then... Somehow, we slip into the sins of Laodicea. But then when the glory strikes your heart again, and there's that revelation of divine majesty, that he's so much bigger than anything that we could think or conceive or imagine or plan or design or explain. And we stand in awe of it. The old hymn, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. When that reverberates again on the inside and that song comes up. I mean, last week we had, uh, we had uh, shouts about the, the, the triumphal procession because we're waving palm branches and talking about the cross. And now we've got to put those together, right? If we live in the triumphal entry in the wrong way that we get this sort of triumphal, nothing ever, bad's ever going to happen. If something bad does happen, it's because you sinned and God doesn't like you anymore. Which most of us think when we step on Legos. Then we have the cross where we go through extensive fastings and, and, and uh, some sort of false ascetic practice. You know, we, we end up whipping ourselves, you know, maybe not literally, but in our minds. If I was better, if I was better, if I was better, if I was better. God's not saying that. The declaration of God over the people who come to him in faith is, this is my beloved son or daughter in whom I'm well pleased. See, we live into those one way or the other. If we live too much into one or the other the wrong way, we miss the truth and the reality of the gospel. And if we come to the resurrection, rightly celebrating the triumphal entry, rightly celebrating the trial of Jesus and his crucifixion, we're struck by the majesty of what he did when he rose from the grave. We Americans, we like new things. Look at the lines when there's a new phone right? Or uh, some fancy new car, truck. Hey, we put a, a, a car in space. Why? Because we could, <laughs> right? We like new things. We come back to the story of the gospel and we say, you know, that's really not new. I wonder what I can make up to make it sound new. Because if I can make it new and I can brand that thing, we can get a big crowd and everybody would be happy. But let me tell you something about the gospel. It's timeless. It's coming from an act of God that was done in history, but it's forever for all of us. And if we can enter into the story, into the resurrection as it is accounted for us, if maybe what those women experienced on that morning, oh, by the way, um, without women preaching the gospel, there'd be no evidence that Jesus rose to the apostles, in case you're wondering. Just throw that out there. If we don't get struck with that awe, you know what we're going to do in our hearts? We take the majesty, we take our marveling at the mystery, and we say, it's just a myth. We may not do it consciously. We may not say it with our mind. We may not tell our neighbors or our friends or our coworkers. But here, on the inside, that's how we treat it. And the danger with that is we don't even know that we've done it because treating the resurrection as a myth is the culture that we live in. It's the fish tank that we swim in. And the last thing fishes discover, fishes, the last thing fishes discover is the water. The last thing a fish is aware of is water. You get the metaphor. You know, it swims into its little house, finds its food, but does it ever notice the water? And the water for us is the culture that we are in. The last thing that we see that affects us is what affects us the most. So I'm going to leave you with a question this morning. 
Those women came to the tomb. There's the young man in white with that awesome testimony. He's not here. And I wonder, like, did they, did they tremble, you know? Were they, were they, were they knee-knocking? Like, how, how significant was this thing that happened to them? That they go running from the tomb, and Mark says that they're quiet. Obviously not for long. This morning, will the gospel resonate inside of you to move you like those women or like the soldiers who were there who saw the angel come down, who saw the stone be rolled away, who fell in fear and in trembling, but they weren't moved to Jesus? Stand with me. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you, you love us beyond our ability to comprehend it. That your delight in us is beyond our understanding. So Father, I pray that this Easter season, your church would be aware of your favor, of your gaze, of your kindness. That your people would know, Lord, your affection because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. Holy Spirit, we give over all that we are to you, and we ask you to fill us with your life, with your light, and with your power. Amen. I ask you to uh, remain standing and join us in confessing the words of the Nicene Creed. Prayer, I ask you to, uh, to join me and pray. Oh Lord, join me. Inspire Ascension to be a church that encounters God through your spirit, embodies Christ in your sacraments, equips your church by the scriptures, and engages the world around us as those sent to declare that Christ is King. For Foley, our Archbishop, John, our Bishop, and for all the clergy and people of our diocese and congregation. For Clancy and Church of the Holy Spirit in Leesburg, as well as Justin and New Creation Church in Hagerstown. Amen. I ask you now to lift your petitions to the Lord loud enough that we can agree with you. Thank you, Lord. Jacqueline, and she goes in for surgery tomorrow for her eyes. I just pray for perfect comfort and peace through this whole procedure, and that you would guide the hands of the doctor, and that 
When she comes out, it will not be a trial, but it will be a triumph, and she will rejoice in it. In Jesus' holy name. Yes. I invite you to offer your thanksgivings to the Lord. Lord, we thank you. We glory in you. And we pray, Father, that your spirit would strengthen our inner being, that Christ may dwell in our hearts by faith, so that we might grow into the fullness of him who is the head of the body. I encourage you now to begin to confess your sins silently to the Lord. 